Welcome to Nothing Is OB South Texas Golf Podcast with your host, Andy Torres. All right, guys, welcome to Nothing Is OB South Texas Golf Podcast. I have a very special guest on tonight. I have the 1996 Texas Open winner, David Ogren, on the show tonight. He's going to talk a little bit about his time on tour, his experiences on being the Texas Open champion, and him and his round with Tiger. Hey, David, thanks for joining the show, brother. I appreciate you being on. Thanks, Andy. I appreciate it. Looking forward to chatting with you and sharing with uh, your listeners um, Texas Open stuff. Well, I want to know first off the gate, uh, is it is it Texas Open when, when people refer to you as the Texas Open champion or do they have to say Valero Texas Open champion? How are they referred to, to you? Well, you know, technically I'm the La Cantera Texas Open champion because La Cantera Development Corporation was the title sponsor of the year I won. Right now, it's obviously the Valero Texas Open. Um, a long time, Bill Greehe and the Valero Corporation literally saved the golf tournament in San Antonio and turned it into one of the premier events uh, here in the spring, uh, the, the spring schedule. But I think generically, people just call it the Texas Open. I think they know it's, it's had multiple sponsors, multiple venues. And so when they talk about former Texas Open champion, that's that's good enough for me. <clears throat> when I sign something or um, refer to it, I always credit Valero, the current sponsor, because I think they deserve a lot of credit for building the tournament into what it is today. I do think it's really huge. And so what you're saying is, is that the tournament was close to being no more? That's exactly what I'm saying. So... Um, my my year of winning over there at La Cantera, uh, Valero had yet to come in, and so they had a bridge sponsor the year I the year I won it, and then Bill Greehe and the Valero Corporation came in and just did a great job, and then with the move to TPC San Antonio and the JW Marriott over there, the the tournament took on a whole different dimension, and um, it's become a premier event. For the guys to come to and i do believe actually that moving the week in front of the masters is really helping them because you'll have probably 15 guys in the field whose names are your listeners will know who aren't in the masters field they can only get there by winning yeah and it seems like a lot of guys are also using it as a tune-up to get their games sharpened for for augusta now you had the privilege of playing in Augusta. How was it? Is it is it just like everybody sees at home? Is it lush and beautiful? Are the greens icy? Yeah, it's lush and beautiful. Um, I played three times. I played in 1984, and then I had a 13 year break, and then I played in 1997, 1998. So I played the year the Tiger Woods won his first one, and it was fabulous. Um, great event. Um, it's a little bit intense. It, it really is. The, the town of Augusta actually kind of isn't big enough to hold something of that magnitude, but they make it work. Um, and the pimento cheese sandwiches are as good as everybody thinks they are. I'm not a fan. Of, I'm not a fan of pimento cheese. I'm just, I'm just not a fan. Does it matter? You go to Augusta, you get pimento cheese. <laughs> okay, so they have right, right, everything, and everything from what I hear is like just super cheap there. I guess for the fans and for everybody there, like beers are like a dollar fifty. Ice cream, the peach sandwich, ice cream sandwiches are like a dollar fifty. And again, pimento sandwiches, all their sandwiches, egg salad sandwiches are like a buck and change. Yeah, it's part of, um, it's part of the lore of the place. Uh, there is no revenue pressure on the on the masters to make revenue on beer and egg salad sandwich sales so it's not like the concessionaires at the texas open <laughs> who are there to actually make some money as the concessionaire um everything at the masters is owned by the masters 
I don't think anybody at, or the tournament at the Masters um, is uh, hurting for any kind of money, so it's not a big deal. Al, when did it all start? Where did it all start for you in the game of golf? Starts with my dad, and um, this is a great message for your listeners out there, dads. Um, get your kids to the golf course. Get them some clubs. Get them playing. Get them hitting. And my dad was brilliant. He was he was a pretty good golfer himself, and he just had me play, and stayed out of my way. And I developed, and he supported me. Uh, I, I just come off about a, I don't know, probably an all day back and forth on a couple of coaching forums about parental involvement and how uh, overbearing parents can really kill a kid's um, desire to play. And so I have some. I have some great parents. I have a couple of tough ones. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's, it, it's getting to the point where you just got to, at some point, I have to coach the dad. Dad, you have the biggest influence on your kid. Take care of it. Do it right. And everything will be okay. I think as, as a teacher and a coach myself, that's what I do for my daytime job. It it's It's really hard to kind of be that, that parent in the stands that just kind of holds back. But it seems like that that mom that reads the book maybe or that dad that is just kind of just watching and kind of just hanging out, it seems like those kids are the ones that maybe benefit the most. doesn't matter what sport it is, Andy. Uh, the child, the young person has to be the, the, the motivator, the driving force behind whatever success there is. Uh, I just got done watching four days of um, high school golf after watching a couple days of junior golf um, and um, watching my students play and, and seeing the ebbs and flows of their performance and, you know, trying to communicate with and celebrate with and commiserate with the parents uh, on those performances. Um, and there's so much good information out there for parents right now there's kind of really no reason not to be good at it. I, I told, I totally agree as, as a coach, as a father, uh, I'm, I'm seeing my daughter's in eighth grade. My daughter's 13 years old. She's in eighth grade and she's about to go to high school. And so we're telling her that, look, you, you're going to do something, right? So you need to pick something you, you want to do and that you don't mind doing every day because we're not going to do it for you. And, you know, I'm sure you know from from being at the top of your golf game to being a successful businessman that you are right now and running an, an awesome range, an awesome practice and training golf training facility you have at the David Ogren Academy there in New Bronzeville. You know that that you can't want it for the kids. They have to want to put the work in and it's got to be a labor of love. Yeah. And. Uh, I have a I have a number of different young young people as clients and people come regularly to practice at my place that uh, have a chance to succeed. Uh, so I really enjoy those folks. Um, enjoy talking with them, even if they're not my student. Um, just by them coming across my path, I let them know I care about them. I'm there for them. I'm trying to get them grass and golf balls and. Uh, like this week, I opened all four days a little bit early so that the high schoolers could get their uh, warm up in for uh, Lander Park. It was great. Uh, I had a lot of fun uh, doing that, and uh, look forward to uh, to seeing where the next cycle of golf tournaments and um, uh, things that happen at Lander Park uh, bring to my door because I have a good working relationship with the people at Lander Park. It's it's a great it's a great course to be uh, to be kind of partnered with or to have a great working relationship with. Oh, absolutely, Chad Donigan, the professional there, and Quinn Alexander. I've known them a long time. I've gotten um, uh, Brody Dillard, their superintendent. He comes helps me out just because he thinks it's the right thing to do. I mean, I'm not a grow, grass growing expert. I can grow weeds with the best of them. <laughs> so. Um, you know, um, it, but it's been really fun in our community uh, to uh, have have a facility that um, families can use that is junior friendly, and um, you know, watching what it may uh, 
may spark here in the next 10 or 15 years. So what was it before? Was it another range or was it another facility before you took it over? Because I know, uh, and, and it looks great, man. The, the the range looks awesome. I love how you you teach your students how to cut the grass, how to cut your practice greens in your short game area. Has it always been a range or because I know you, I guess you recently took over or got the facilities at what, maybe two, three years ago? Yeah. So uh, back in 2010, a uh, local businessman built the driving range. Uh, he ended up buying the amusement center in front. He ended up selling off the amusement center for um, a storage uh, place. In the meantime, the property owner uh, built a uh, access easement back into the property because he wasn't sure what he was going to do with it. And next thing you know, when one thing comes to another, I made an offer on it and decided to go on my own. Hated to leave San Pedro, hated to leave the Alamo City Golf Trail, but I did. Hated to leave Travis Salkowski just kind of hanging there, um, you know, doing <laughs> nothing but um, sweating over his uh, Elmo City Golf Trail tour and his used club business. <laughs> well, I think Travis is doing all right for himself. The tour is it's hot. And as you know, being a business owner, and I'm sure you've seen, it seems like everybody is is loving, you know, that golf is such a great sport to get out there, to have some bro time, to really learn about being outdoors and learn a lot about themselves. And so I'm sure your business has to be benefiting from this big golf boom. Yeah. You know, who knew um, two years ago, because um, right now we would have been right in the middle of about a 30 day period. Where, where nobody knew where the uh, the worldwide pandemic was going. And, um, you know, uh, we, we closed down on March 23rd and uh, we got reopened about April 25 that year. And when we got back, people who had kind of put golf on the side realized, hey, outdoors, you better not stand any closer to six feet from Andy Torres because he will nip you with his shankopotamus, right? It, it, um, it's, it's less than six feet. You don't have to be. I know, right? So, um, you know, all of a sudden people rediscovered golf. Golf kind of got to be an activity that um, was okay. And, and I, think, I think anybody who had withstood that first six months of 2020, uh, has done very well, and it continues to go this way. My industry experts seem to project is still in about another two or three year run before um, it might tire out a little bit. But also during that time, the number of facilities shrunk, so it, it's almost finding a real profitable equilibrium for the people who've waited it out. I I totally agree in that. It seems like especially when the Alamo City Golf Trail closed down almost, it put a lot of pressure on the rest of the courses in town. And then with the Republic closed, again, putting more heat and more pressure on the other courses to provide those tee times, provide those services. But, it, I mean, golf is hot right now, and it's great. And it, it's really good because you can really kind of help mold that as you work with many juniors and many youth. And I always see you. I always see you playing. I saw it. If I'm not mistaken, I think did you go to Pinehurst, right? Were you at we at Pinehurst uh, with some of your some of your students, and you got to play? I guess some of the rounds out there. Yeah, I went. I went to Pinehurst just uh, just after the uh, U.S. Kids World uh, Championship, and uh, I had a couple students that I had co coached a long time ago up in Casper, Wyoming, on one of my uh, safaris, and had a great time. Uh, I'm just now finishing up a um, nine-week uh, hosting of an international student. Uh, he plays one more uh, STPGA event on Sunday. Then he heads back to Bermuda. So if you see pictures of Oliver Betchart, Oliver um, has come to America to, to compete in junior golf because he doesn't have anything in Bermuda. He's been a blast. And then I'm looking forward to the summer where we do multiple PGA junior camps um, and still continue on with our um, homegrown programming 
like Operation 36, Birdie Basics. And because I now have a second coach, Eric Illich, we're going to re, uh, reignite um, Get Golf Ready for Adults, Stay Golf Ready for Adults. Eric and I are talking about doing a, um, a short game kind of golf school. Hasn't been one in town for a long time. That's where, you, they, that's, that's where you take that's where you take strokes off your game. That's where you take strokes off your score. Or um yeah, or not embarrass yourself. <laughs> and, those, and these are all things that are needed. And I know uh, I know a good a good amount about Operation 36. My good buddy, the head pro at Corpus Christi Country Club, uh Brent Blackburn. Yeah, uh, you know, he broke it down for me. And I know uh I know him, I know you do it at your facility, and I know you do it at, at Landa as well. And I know it's a great, it's a great program. And I did, I, you know, it, you might not have known it, known this, but I did kind of sneak into some of your, your talks where you had with the creator of birdie basics and some of the, some of the gatherings you had of some of these great, these great coach, these great golf minds. And I, and I just love to kind of dabble in that and listen to it. And just kind of, it always uh, piques my interest to hear what the top as a coach, you always want to know, what other great coaches are doing. I'm not saying I'm a great coach, but I love to hear what some of the best coaches in the games and how, how they're doing it to how they're reaching their kid. Yeah. You know, um, I think the, the, the coaches that I talk to, uh, they all have what um, has been called the growth mindset. That is they, anybody who's really good at what they do, um, never thinks that they have the answer. You know, they know what they know and they can share what they know, but they're always asking the question, what else do I need to know? And the farther I've gone along um, as a coach, um, the more interested I am in getting better at this so that uh, my students and, and my, my, my customers, the people come to the range so that they come and leave happy. Right. And if they enjoy the experience at my place, then I'm going to be just fine. Um, and, and my students, if they get better, they'll be just fine. This was actually an intense week, as, as I mentioned before, because this was uh, districts week all across um, the city. And I had a bunch of kids doing stuff. I had some successes. I had some failures. Um, uh, I was just watching one of my girls. Uh, that lost the playoff to be second medalist or second individual medalist to go to, to regionals. So you've seen success and heartbreak and watching how they handle it is really cool. Watching how a kid strikes out and comes back to the bench is really cool. It's, it's almost as important as, yeah, we know how to act if you hit a hole, hole in one or a home run, but you know, when you make a double bogey or you, you strike out, how do you act? I freaking love that, David. I love that. I, I've been I've been teaching and coaching for 16 years, and I always talk to the kids about body language, and uh, about or you know, I, I teach and coach football, and I tell the kids, I said, "Look, guys, whenever we come to the huddle, I, I know you're tired. I know you're working hard. I know you're thirsty. I know it's hot out here, but don't let the other team know that that it, that you're hot, that you're thirsty, that you're tired, and it's about your mentality. And I love that. I I, I love that." As you want to see, you want to see how your kids take the failure, right? Well, yeah, and uh, I have a couple of kids who, who actually part of my instruction is body language when they hit a clunky shot. When you hit a clunky shot, nobody else needs to know on the golf course you hit a clunky shot. I had the pleasure of playing with Tom Watson, and Tom Watson acted as if he hit every shot dead solid, perfect. Could never tell where Tom Watson hit the ball, and as a result, um, he was he they, they called him almost unflappable when he be, learned how to win. But I, I played with him in the Western Open, and he hit a shot on the eighth hole at Butler National that was dead before it left his club. <laughs> it was going in the middle of the creek, no chance, right? And he stood there, hold his pose, and stared it down. Went in the water. He and Bruce Edwards walked up to the drop circle. He dropped, hit the next shot, held his post, hit it about 15 feet, knocked it in, made four. 
went on, <laughs> went on to win the tournament, right? And he had, he hit a shot that you would you would see half of Travis's guys hit um, if they were playing at a, a Elmo City Golf Trail Tour event at Butler National, <laughs> right in the middle of the river. Well, I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna tell you, you know what? You you walk you walk the walk and you you talk the talk as well. And we're gonna get into a little bit of that later. But I'm gonna tell you, I've been around like Travis has got some top dogs that that play on that tour and and seeing those guys focus. And one thing we we spoke about because I host a, a tour recap with Travis and his ambassadors is that I've noticed that a lot of these these upper echelon players like the Champions Flight and First Flight they love to walk. They love to walk and. I guess it's because I truly, I truly feel as when I walk, I feel like I actually play quicker than when I ride. Well, you know, if if, if you if you actually can, right, it would be the way to play the game. Um, today, I watched the lead group of the girls' golf tournament stay right on the heels of the men's group at uh, Landa Park. It was awesome. I mean, these girls just motored down the fairway. Um, you know, I got to the point a few years ago where I, I decided two things. Number one, I don't have to make any downhill left to right four footers anymore to make my living. And if I don't want to walk, I don't have to. So, <laughs> well, okay. So I have people constantly chiming in, right? I have a lot of people chiming in cause I'm also giving out a pair of tickets to the Valero, to the Texas Valero open tomorrow, right? To tomorrow's round. So I have a good friend of mine. Her name, it, it, sometimes it doesn't come up here because they have to register. Or I have this go, streaming on so many different places. Her name is Allie Trevino. I al I know she also does stuff for Northside. She's a, she does a mid-am qualifiers, and she also is an assistant coach for our Lady of the Lake golf team. And so she was just saying right now that the girls' playoff was so intense. Yeah, so um... – in fact, I'm glad Our Lady of the Lake has the uh, the women's team now. Um, I've got my name just flew out of my Ar brain. Arnie Martinez uh, is the head coach. Yeah, Arnie's the head coach, but uh, a young lady that I have um, chatted with for years is one of his players, and she comes from one of the non-traditional schools down on the south side or in the city. And um, uh, as a player, in fact, think, uh, come to think of it um, – Christy Cano, who was down there at Texas A&M San Antonio, she came from Edison High School, right? So you have, uh, you know, you got that whole group of SAISD schools, Edison and Lanier and um, um, I know Burbank. Southside, I, know, I know Southside. Southside has Southside, had, had South Sand, right? It shows it's possible. It shows oh. it's possible. And I know down on the South Side, uh, you got um, – uh, you got Ray Garza. No, oh, Ray, trying he's the man. To get a, trying to get a toehold, right? Trying to get a toehold into um, getting that community involved in golf in a, in, in a little bit more competitive, formal way. And I think it's a brilliant, a brilliant idea. Um, so, you know, I'm pulling for him tremendously. Uh, great idea. Just a tremendous asset to the community. But anyway, um, yeah, the the when 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 these kids get these playoffs and stuff, it's a great learning experience. My girl lost this one here in New Braunfels, and how she handles it will be as important as whether or not she won it. I I totally agree, man. That's spoken like a true coach, and not. I love how how you refer to yourself as a coach because sometimes some people say that they're instructors, and it seems well, like. The, the 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 instructor works really kind of on maybe just like the mechanics. You work on the, you work on the whole person. Yeah. So I mean, I, you know, you get in an instructor mode and you say, you know, uh, turn your wrist another twelve degrees, right? Whatever. But then one of my favorite things is, you know, um, uh, my my best player today after burning the first three holes, she decides to drive it in the bunker on number four at Landa Park. And so, you know, when I get to see her again uh, tomorrow or the next day, I'm going to do some coaching. And here's what the coach is going to be. Say, uh, don't do that. That's <laughs> oh, good that's, coaching. That's don't the do best, that. Right? That's do the best coaching. Else. Or, or my favorite line, just remember. 
Just remember, remember, Just remember, remember. remember. <laughs> it's 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 not a good idea to double dribble, right? <laughs> it, 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 it's 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 not a it's not a good idea to uh, to balk when you're on the on the <laughs> That's right, exactly. Or like the, what happened the other night when the Texas Tech guy stole home and the pitcher never looked up against. Um, uh, man, but that that guy that guy was lazy. I, if I was a coach, I'd be chewing him out. Well, I, know, sure I know, I know. Algie sure Garrido, Algie Garrido, God rest his soul. Man, he, there would probably be another livid video where he'd be F this, F this, F this, if yeah. he were still alive. All right. I got one of, the, one of the viewers right here, Casey Graham, one of the tour ambassadors. David, who is your all-time coach? Who do you look up to? Um, Good question, Casey. Is it personally or just kind of in general? I think Did, may, I, I think maybe just uh, maybe your all-time coach, and it could be uh, – you love baseball. You love the game of right. baseball. Okay, so, so uh, pick one. I, I'll, I'll knock off a few. Me personally, as a professional golfer, I had three mentors that really profoundly affected my game. One was Jim Suddy. Dr. Jim Suddy is the godfather of golf biomechanics. Another one would be Dave Pels. Dave Pels is probably the godfather of short game specialty. And the next would be Chuck Hogan. Chuck Hogan and Bob Rotella would have been the first two really in the brain game. But then when I watch the coaching landscape, I really try to figure out what Bill Belichick, Nick Saban, and Greg Popovich know. Hey, they're, they're, they're tough. They're tough, hard-nosed, hard-nosed coaches. And you know what? They've always, uh, this is my show, nothing is OB. So they've always made chicken salad out of chicken shit. They did. They have. I mean, even even this year's Spurs team, which and I don't watch much basketball. I know they compete. And then, you know, what's interesting is is watching who came from. And so obviously out of the Popovich tree comes Steve Kerr. Now I, I've had a little bit of interaction with Steve back in the day when he was um, here in San Antonio. We played a little bit of golf together. I also got a chance to play with Doc Rivers back in the day when he was here. But you know, watching how watching how the uh, Warriors play, and you go, yeah, sure you can win with those guys. Well, maybe not, right? So you know, Steve Kerr knows something in baseball. I mean, um, I really, I really think that uh, be careful of the Angels this year because Joe Madden knows what he's doing. Man, he's he's a great coach. He's he's a player's coach. Everywhere he's been, his guys play hard for him. His and, guys play you know, hard for him. They they haven't uh, they haven't had much pitching out in LA for him. But if they get any pitching at all, they're going to be tough. Um, so yeah, that, that, that's those those are some of the guys that I like. Funny you say you keep you keep saying you keep referring to these guys as Godfather. So you're telling me that you're like in the golf mafia when as your upbringing. <laughs> you know, yeah, maybe so. <laughs> you know. Um, you what, can't talk about it. You can't talk about it, though. No, no. At my mm -hmm. age, no. At my age, right? The, the, there's coaches my age: uh, David Ledbetter, Hank Haney, Mike Adams, um, Butch, Jim McLean. Butch is older. Yeah. Butch is a little older, but you know, the, the, there are some guys in my age group that went on to be really, really, really good coaches. And so, um, you know, I had this long playing career, and now I'm just 20 years behind him. I, I, I know 20 years less than these guys do. <laughs> well, let's get into that. Let's get into a little bit about your playing career. So how did it all start for you on the PGA Tour? How did you really get that big break? Um, so I went to school 76 to 80 at Texas A&M, and um, when I got out, uh, I just started the qualifying process. I missed in the uh, fall of 1980, and I missed in the spring of 1981, and then I missed in the uh, yeah, and I missed in the fall of 1981, and then they didn't have another one until the fall of 1982. So in the meantime, I go play South Africa, Asia, Europe. I play the mini tours around the country. But it was really 1982 when I went to South Africa, Asia, and Europe. I did what Oliver is doing here. I went overseas. I went and played. 
I came back and I made it. I made uh, I made the first qualifying that they had at TPC Sawgrass. I'm, I'm the first uh, graduating class of the All Exempt Tour in the fall of 82. And I went out in 1983 and I discovered I was a cut making machine. I just kept making cuts, making cuts, make, make 19 cuts. And I finished like about 121st on the money list. And it took me about nine years to lose my card or eight years to lose my card. And then I had a little slump. And that's when I uh, hired uh, the three guys I mentioned, uh, Jim Suddy and uh, Dave Pels and Chuck Ogham. And they led me up to the, to the win of the Texas Open. Then I had a great 1997 as well. I finished second twice. Um, and then um, 1998, I, I was playing and I was, I was doing great. And then I had an unfortunate thing happen. I stepped out of my golf cart and twisted my knee, discovered I tore some cartilage. So I played uh, the last eight tournaments of the year with torn cartilage in my knee. It really hurt. I made six cuts. Um, and then I didn't finish in the top 125, and I had to make a decision. Uh, go to tour school or get my knee scoped. And I chose to get my knee scoped. So I got my knee scoped. And then I went out in 1999, and 1999, if you recall, was the Ryder Cup year at Brookline. Justin Leonard and Ben Crenshaw yeah. and Tom Lehman and all those guys, right? That year, it seemed like everybody played every week. All of the top players played a lot of golf. And so I only got 19 events, and I didn't keep my card, and I never got it back. And uh, so that was the downside of it. Uh, right in the middle of that, of course, I won the Texas Open. Uh, 1985, I lost the playoff to Hell Sutton. 1989, I lost in the um, playoff of what's called the Half Nelson. We only had a 36 hole event that Neil Lancaster won. <laughs> the Half Nelson. I get that. Yeah, well, the, the whole golf course is almost taken out by a tornado, so we're okay oh, with it. Um, but anyway, so, you know, I had a lot of ups and downs, uh, recently on the, on the television, they've had some interesting stats, uh, the other week, uh, they said that, um, uh, I was the last guy to win my first tournament, making a triple bogey in the last round. I saw that stat. I saw, I saw that, that stat. stat. And yeah. then I got on the consecutive cuts list when John, John Rum, no consecutive rounds on uh, power better John Rom or something shot one over par or something in LA. And I got on that list too. <laughs> the Fred Funk is right in front of me, which is just another reason to hate Fred Funk. <laughs> All right, best player that that you've seen yourself, like or best swing, just somebody that you've admired as you were grow going up the ranks. Well, <clears throat> um, I got to play with Tiger Woods. Incomparable in 1997, 1998, just. Unbelievable. I also got to play with Jack Nicholas, And uh, playing with Jack uh, was really an education. Uh, so those two uh, do tangibly rake above everybody else. Um, I can remember being really impressed with Greg Norman and Sebi Ballesteros as well. Uh, and then somebody who I really admired was Tom Kite. I love Tom Kite. Texas. Tom, He's a Texas guy. Tom Kite seemed to get the most out of the least, out of anybody in the history. He's a small really, guy. Really, he did. Small guy. He did. And, um, you know, he, uh, for a short time, he was the leading money winner of all time. I, I've always liked guys like him, Corey Pavin. I guess it's just, I'm a, I'm a little dude, right? So I like, so, so I always have, I like the little guys. I, I really do. And so why don't you tell us, uh, take us down memory lane. And how did the whole 1996 tournament play out for you? Like, how did that round one go and, and right. so forth? All right. So first of all, this is the Tiger Woods coming out fall. So the, the narrative is weaving around Tiger Woods, no matter how you want to cut it. Tiger comes out in Milwaukee, makes the cuts in the middle of the pack, does the miracle hole in one. Right. And then we go to like Milwaukee and Quad Cities and BC Open. And I think there's another and there's Vegas in there. Right. So we go something like uh, uh, Milwaukee, 
Canada, BC, uh, Vegas or something, right? So Ed Fiore beats him in Moline. Dudley Hart beats him in uh, the BC Open. I forgot who, who won Canada that year. It doesn't really matter. Then Tiger wins in Vegas. First win. The Shriner, right? Well, whatever it was then, yeah. right? <clears throat> so I'm playing really good this whole time. I'm making these cuts. I'm finishing in the top 10. Uh, I, I'm playing really, really well. And I had a very interesting discussion with one of my mentors, Chuck Hogan. Third time I've mentioned his name. So I'm sitting there on Saturday night. I called Chuck Hogan. I said, Chuck, all I really want to do is hit the ball solidly. And this is out of bounds, right? Yeah, yes. Nothing is OB. Chuck says, bullshit. <laughs> I'm going, what do you mean? He says, David, be careful what you ask for. Are you playing good? Yes. What do you really want? He said, I'm playing good enough to win. Do you really want to win? Okay. So then I get to San Antonio. And what, what, what you got to remember about that year in San Antonio is that we had a hurricane or tropical storm or something dump an ungodly amount of rain on San Antonio. So they had an ungodly amount of rough at La Cantera. They couldn't even mow it. That's how, that's how, that's how wet it was coming into the tournament. And uh, so I get there and I shoot uh, kind of a, a really good 70 the first round. And this is the resort, the resort course. The resort correct? course. Okay. And then I, I made a weak bogey on number nine, finishing up. Second day, I shoot 67, played really good. Now, I'd had a chance to go out and map the greens at La Cantera. This is the second year at La Cantera. Duffy Waldorf won the first one. But I had a, a green reading chart that I did myself, not like to do today, right, that became illegal or whatever they did with the, that, that, that thing by rule. So I knew all the nuances of the breaks. And then I go out in the third round and I shoot 65. Wow. Including a birdie on the last one. I take the lead going into the last day. So the last day I'm playing with Jay Haas and Tommy Armour the third. Tiger's right in front of me. And uh, I make seven birdies, shoot even par, Ooh. including the triple on six. <laughs> I triple six and walking up to the seventh tee, the one we shoot down at the Rather. Yeah. I turned to my caddy and I said, I just made a triple bogey and I didn't lose the lead. <laughs> right. And then I birdied seven, eight, nine, and 10. So how wow. do you, how do you, how do you, how do you make up for a triple bogey? You birdie the next four. <laughs> That's how you do it. Right. 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 And so then right I make a two couple bogeys and a couple birdies. And I've got, I think a four shot lead going into 15. And I par 15, bogey 16, par 17. And on 18, I hit in the bunker, and I hit it on the edge of the green, and I chipped it up about 8 feet, 10, 10 feet, 10 feet. And that was the summer that Jesper Parnovic made some kind of mistake on the scoreboard at the British Open. So I walked over to the rules official, and I pointed to my sign, and I pointed to the scoreboard, and I said, are those correct? Oh, damn. Right? He said, yes. Took my 10-footer. I knocked it down to six inches. <laughs> you know, I'm shaking, tap it in, win the tournament. Don't remember anything else. Out of body experience. It was wonderful. Uh, Sharon, my wife, tells me that, um, that uh, there was um, – bagpipes i don't remember any of it i go to the press tent do my press thing uh go to a little ceremony they had on the uh driving range um uh, tony piazzi pops some champagne i drink some sham 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 sh yeah some <laughs> champagne and in the meantime i have one of the staff people calling continental airlines Keep telling him I'm on my way, I'm on my way, I'm on my way. <laughs> so I get to the terminal, hop on the plane, go to Houston, go to um, Disney. And I'm up at 6 o'clock the next morning for an 8 o'clock tea time for the Oldsmobile scramble at Disney. 
What? So you didn't even get a chance to enjoy your win. That's not true. <laughs> so, so, so uh, Continental puts me in first class. I get to, I get down to Disney and I, I get about six, five hours of sleep. And I walk out to the property at Disney. Or Disney has a, uh, the clubhouse and the ho hotel. They got putting greens on two sides. And I kind of took the left drop. And over there was Bobby Watkins. Bobby Watkins had played the tour like 20 years and never won. Lanny Watkins' brother. And he gave me the most heartfelt congratulations handshake that you could ever get from another guy because he knows how important it is to go from zero wins officially to one win. And so, yeah, I played the Rosemont Bill Scramble, played the Disney tournament, and I got to celebrate when I got home with everybody. I love I I love how the how Disney has it set up with uh, I've played the Palms and the Magnolia there. I love how they have it set up and they have Payne Stewart's locker uh, in there and they have uh, some of his knickers and mm -hmm. his hat and uh, and right there we got a let's see I got a got a good picture of you over here. Uh, let me see right here. Let me. What did I do? What did I me, do? <laughs> well, with that old Top oh. Flight, you know, and so hey, Top Flight, Top Flight seems to be one of your sponsors, and so is Payne. It seems like Top Flight sponsored Payne Stewart as well, and so. I love, yeah, the, I love to see the there's top actually there's actually a story behind that picture because that picture was taken in 1997. I actually won with um, a hodgepodge of golf clubs and a, a and a Max Fly golf ball. And in 1996, believe it or not, a whole bunch of companies were really struggling budget-wise. And I, I think the entire bonus pool I got for my winning from any of my endorsements was $1,000. Damn. That's, yeah. That's, that's a that lot was, different. That's a lot that, different. That, that was a little bit like in a depression era for, for the game of golf. In 96, I mean, the golf industry was kind of struggling. It really was. So the Tiger boom was was real. The Tiger boom was real, especially for y'all as golfers. I think the Tiger boom was real, and the COVID boom is real. And I, I, um, I, I'd like to think that um, a healthy Ryder Cup also helps, too. Oh, hell yeah. I think so, too. It was great to watch it at Whistling Straits this past season and to see, see to see the Americans dominate. It was it was beautiful. It, it was it was beautiful. It was a beautiful thing. I got I got one of a, one of a, the listeners, one of the viewers here. Scott Williams said he was there when you won when you won there at, at, at the or he was there when you played at the uh, there in Disney. Oh, really? <laughs> That's what he said. He said he was interesting. there. interesting. He said he was there. All right. So now, so rumor has it, rumor has it, I'm going to pull up the picture right here. Rumor has it that you were the one that, that uh, because of your win, Tiger never came back to play in the Valero. <laughs> I, I think it's one of the, it, it's one of my taglines. I said, I beat Tiger, I beat Jehas by one, Tiger Woods by two, and I beat Beat him so bad he never came back to San Antonio. <laughs> it's my fault, people. Tigers never come back. <laughs> this is a great picture. Now, now, how did this picture come to be right here? And what hole great, is this on? Great question. So this is the uh, fifth hole at Colonial in the spring of 1997. Now, what's happening here is I'm um, I'm 39 years old and Tiger is uh 20 right so i'm walking behind and i'm going huh i'm almost old enough to be his father so he's walking down the fairway and i start stalking him like i'm stalking my children and um, <laughs> i wish i could remember the name of the guy who took the picture because i i, I really i would actually send him some money because this picture is so cool but there it is. It, it showed up in the paper the next day. And um, it was a really cool moment. What's really interesting is just uh, about 90 minutes later, maybe a, an, an hour later, there's a picture of Tiger and I sitting in the tent. And you might have seen this on a meme, like 
Monday be like, Tuesday be like, <laughs> Wednesday be like. And Tiger and I are just sitting in this tent on the 10th tee at, at Coney, and we're just exhausted. And we're not and we're not saying anything to each other, right? Well, CBS zooms in. And later on when I watched the telecast, they said, you know, they're, they're so intense. They're not talking to each other. Baloney. We were so tired. We couldn't we couldn't even grab a second breath. But we had just finished about a four-hole conversation about Sarah Ferguson, the Duchess of York. <laughs> what, who, had what about? Up, who, who had showed up at uh, the Byron Nelson the week before. So, <laughs> you know, there's stuff that happens out there that you just don't you just don't ever hear. <laughs> All right. Craziest, craziest thing that has happened on tour that you witnessed. Craziest thing. Ooh. Craziest thing. Because I hear I hear all kinds of stuff. I hear all kinds of stuff that that people see in regards to, let's say, you know, guys smoking cigarettes, but you never see it on camera. And uh, because one time I, I I'm not too sure if you know the pro. His name is Tim Heron. Yeah. I think he won. Uh, right, I think he's yeah, yeah, okay, right. So I play. So I carried a bag for somebody in the pro am that he was the pro in, and he had these cigarettes that were cut like really tiny, so he could just smoke, maybe take like three or four drags, yeah. and then flip, right. And he was doing that, and I mean, you know, you know how it is here sometimes in San Antonio. We go through droughts, right? Well, he's doing this there at TPC, at and so I'm telling him, I said, "Look, Tim, I don't want to tell you your business, but." It's dry as hell out here. That's how, that's how brush fires start. Uh-huh. Oh, golly gee. We're straight. Well, I will tell a story on myself. And my brother-in-law, if he was listening, could corroborate this. So I get paired with Jack Nicholas at the Canadian Open at Glen Abbey. And um, we tee off and go down to the first screen. And the first green goes back out to the gate of the club, and there's like a cul-de-sac there. And there's about 35, 40 people marching in a circle. And uh, the signs they're calling for ending apartheid in South Africa. Random protest, right? And all of a sudden, we're on the putting green, and they start chanting, shame on David Ogren. Shame on <laughs> David Ogren. So we putted out and going to the next tee. Jack turns to me and says, David, why are they calling you out? And I said, I, I guess, Jack, because in 1982, I went down there to play the Sunshine Tour. And he it was just like, I'm playing with Jack Nicholas, and I'm getting heckled from across the fence. It's just like so random. I also <laughs> got heckled the next week, too, by the way, at the U.S. Open. So it's, it is what it is. Outside of Augusta, your favorite course that you played on tour? Same answer I've given since 1984. Uh, I got to play in the 1984 U.S. Open at Wingfoot. And on the Sunday round, um, we played what the pros would call one foot in the grass, which you might call the tips. I mean, they had the tees <laughs> back as far as they could go. Every the Wingfoot, the wing foot, Every they're, in New, they're in New York, right? Right. And uh, the pins were just tucked. They were lost. They were in the corners. And it was probably the best golf course I had ever played. I played great and shot four over par 74. I mean, I played great. Um, and, uh, you know, finished uh, 293 for the tournament. And, uh, um, you know, about 30th place, 28th place or something. <laughs> but it was it was just easily the best golf course I ever played. What is What was probably your lowest point uh, of your career? Even though I went through a slump in 1991... 1992. The lowest point of my career happens um, much later in the fall of 2009 
when um, after my second year on the Champions Tour, I go over to Houston to play in the regional qualifier, second stage or whatever stage it was, and I missed. And I missed. And driving home, I, I began to cry because I knew that my playing career was over. So that would have been 2009. My playing career was done. Um, to be honest with you, I hated the Champions Tour. Um, it wasn't any fun. A bunch of the guys that I thought were really good were really kind of dicks on the Champions Tour. Um, I walked into my second Champions Tour event in 28 and uh, 2008, and um, one of the guys said, what the F are you doing here? And then he meant it. That was, <laughs> and he meant it, right? So um, that, was, that was a low point. And then in 2010, I had my chance to start coaching, right? So really, if that was my starting career as coaching, I've been at it for 12 years. Well, I think you've done some great things, and it seems like maybe what would have been your low point for you has also been maybe like a another pinnacle, another mountain for you to climb because it seems like you're still you're still on the uprise. Well, man, was I a mediocre coach when I started. <laughs> I really was. But I had some ideas. One of those ideas was you really can't coach until you see the kids play on the golf course. You really can't coach a kid until you see him play on the golf course. And so I know a couple guys in town are really good swing coaches, but they really don't go watch to see what their kids do. And I try to get out as much as I can to see what my kids do because it's important for me to know what, just by observing what I have to work on, what I think is most important. It's like my boy Oliver up here. Um, he's 13 years old. He's from Bermuda. He's been here for nine weeks. You know, he's playing one more tournament at Fort Sam. Then he gets to go home. But I know his, I now know what he needs to work on uh, in the next 10 months before he comes back. And it's because I've watched him play. And I've watched him do 70s and I've watched him do 83s. Well, see, that's like my game. I've, I've seen myself go in the 80s, and I see myself go in the 90s. Right. <laughs> and I think that's what make that's what makes you a good coach, and that's what eat, that's what separates you from being an instructor. Yeah, eat more chicken. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take advice from some cows. <laughs> <laughs> okay, favorite course in the I'd say the greater San Antonio area that you are just in love with absolutely positively tpc san antonio oaks course oh yeah that's the one that's great and, norman and, and it's, it's designed, not even right? it's where they're playing right now but but especially andy if we go out and play the green tees at 6200 yards it's easily the best golf course in town at 6200 yards it's way too hard at 7200 that thing's but, long yeah, play, play it a thousand yards shorter, and it is so much fun. I know people like San Antonio Country Club. I know people like Oak Hills. Um, but, um, and it's kind of sad that, um, you know, in town, you got those two, and then you got Briggs Ranch and Boot Ranch out of town uh, or Cordillera, but that's kind of like a little bit out. Right? I consider I consider that greater. Yeah, I mean it's, yeah. it's kind of you know it's in the vicinity. The Oaks course is is easily the best golf course of the bunch. I love it. I'm going to be there tomorrow covering covering tomorrow, and so I'm pretty excited about getting out there. Now I got I'm going to do a couple of comments right here. Put them up here. I got Jeremy Semlinger. Mm -hmm. he said Coach David Mason says hi. Yeah, Mason's one of our Operation 36 kids. Got some serious talent. Right here. I got, let's see right here. I got another, I got another good one right here. Chris Espinoza. Coach David is an awesome coach. Yeah, Chris uh, is, is one of my guys. 
he actually works with me um, and um, helps us coach, helps. He does a little bit of everything, and um, he's been playing the AM tour and doing just fine. He's He does, man. He's been on there in the past two weeks. I see his picture uh, for the for the, the Alamo City Golf Trail Tour Series, and I'm just like, man, this guy's a stud, man. This guy's got to this guy's got to be a stud. And now the secret's out now that he that he works out at your facility. So now I think Travis and the guys need to bump his need to lower that handicap down. Travis just make sure he doesn't nail his thumb to a two by four. <laughs> well, that's why he has that's why he has the other guys doing it, right? Uh-huh. Travis is just Travis is just a face guy. He's just <laughs> arm waving. <laughs> Well, you should see him. You should see him because we do these shows right like every Tuesday, and you should see him. He has he's always looking and he's doing this thing with his hair and stuff. And I said, I said, I don't know how much longer you're going to be able to do that, buddy. You know that things it's 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 going away quick. Well, we did um we you know we did a couple videos uh, promotional videos for the Elmo City Golf Trail when I was working there uh, along with the Ryan Bell and. Uh, we had some blasts just absolutely totally screwing up and butchering, um, you know, some sort of marketing video. Um, those those were interesting times when they opened up San Pedro. It was it was kind of cool. And um, um, I I hated to leave, but I didn't because I'm, a, I'm my own boss. I make my own mistakes. Um, nobody yells at me. Well, well no, unless true. you, I'm just, My wife yells at me. You know, I was gonna say, I was gonna say, I thought you're, I thought, I know you're the boss, but I think your wife really is. She's, she's the boss, right? Of you. She, she, um, <laughs> she, she ended up retiring from her job. She was a church secretary, and now she helps us out. And I desperately need her to make sure that um, the money doesn't go flying out the back door. <laughs> now, now, Travis always tells me that when I talk about the creation of the ACGT tour series, he said that it was like the child of him and Christy Cano and how he, he was the one that one of the things that his best achievements was uh, opening up San Pedro. And I know that y'all were the staff that really kind of introduced to, you know, the city, which is like a premier range and practice facility that, that is provided to San Antonio. It, it's 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 absolutely the best. Um, um, they did a great little par three around it. Uh, the T line is fantastic. Um, simulator, um, the four golf simulator is really good. And now they got Joe Caruso teaching down there, and Ben Carricker is now doing his, his club repair down there. And um, I think all that's really good. Hopefully they got the food and beverage organized because what a great place to hang out. I go I go there three or four times a week. It's yeah. it's bad. I've gained like twenty pounds in in like Top three ten. months. <laughs> oh man, it's it, it's awesome there. I think my man Ben, uh, he's the he's the guy that works at my clubs. That's good coaching. Stop that. <laughs> Stop that. Dang man, your words of words of wisdom, David O's words words of wisdom. Stop that. All right, Dave, as we get close to the end of this uh, this time, man, I appreciate you being on the show, man. I, I've loved your stories. I got one final question for you. Who are you playing your final round of golf with? Travis Solkowski and Paige Sporanek, but I'm going to push Travis out of the cart. <laughs> Damn, you know what? That's a good one. Oh my gosh. That's I love terrible. Her. That's I terrible of me. No, it's not. I if if I had to if I had to play one more round, if I had to play one more round, um, I would I would go play with uh Tom Lehman and and Tom and uh Tiger Woods. No oh, man, that that's great, dude. That's great. Although I think Paige would be better than both of them anyway. I think so, so too. That's I'm, a great, I, I, that's I'm a great just bringing, answer. I'm just bringing Travis along to push him out of the cart. <laughs> yeah, you know what? I, damn, that's good. But you know what? I don't think you're going to be the only one to ever say that. <laughs> <laughs> well, David, I, I truly appreciate your time, man. Uh, I freaking loved it, man. I love hearing these stories. And I always, everyone always told me, my buddy Ken Palacios, he always said, you know what, David, coach, 
Co- Coach O, David, David O would be so great for the show. And I said, I don't know, man. I think he might be a little too out of bounds for my show. I'll tell you what, Kenny's daughter, Emily, played the best nine holes of any high school girl golfer ever in the history of San Antonio. She shot 39 in her last nine to help Incarnate Word win the state championship. And we worked two years for that nine holes. So hats off to them. I believe it. Ken Ken's one of my good buddies. And I know he was part of those those Incarnate Word state championship teams that had some some awesome golfers that are doing some amazing things. And I know that they're even better young ladies. And yes. uh, thank you. Thank you so much, David. I, I'm looking forward to, man. I just want to know, do I have an open invitation to come out to your facilities? Uh, come on out. Um, $16 for a large bucket. <laughs> I'll pay 17. <laughs> <laughs> All right, David. Thanks brother. Hey, you have a good night. You too. Thank you. Thanks so much for, David being on the show, damn, he has some great stories. I'm so thankful. Uh, I'll always love to hear these stories about these champions, what gets them there, their careers, where they are now. And it seems like David is perfectly, he, he feels great in his, his clothes and in his shoes right now, what he's doing. He's doing some great things, and he's making better young men and women by helping them reach their goals through the game of golf. And golf is it's a game of integrity, game of honesty. I'm so thankful that Dave is doing these great things for the greater for San Antonio and the greater San Antonio there in New Braunfels. Hey guys, thanks for tuning in. I'm going to go ahead and check out the comments, see who's commented. I'm going to let somebody know that they received the, they're going to be the lucky winners of two tickets to tomorrow's VTO round. Thanks for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed the show. Please visit my website, www.nothingobgolf.com. You can hit me up on different forms of social media. I'm on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Nothing is OB is my handle. Also, please check out my YouTube channel, Nothing is OB South Texas Golf Podcast. I'm on iTunes, Spotify, iHeartRadio, SoundCloud. Please click the subscribe button. You can leave a comment, rate, and review. It's how it helps me grow the podcast. I truly thank you for all your support. Remember, in the game of life, nothing is OB.